Hare Krishna, welcome everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, tonight, we're continuing with our study of Bhagavad Gita, as it is, by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. And tonight, uh, we are uh, continuing with Chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita. And tonight, we'll go from verses 11 to 30 of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the contents of the Gita summarized. Now, chapter one uh, is a description. The chapter is entitled Observing the Armies on the Battlefield of Kurukshetra. So it's a description of Arjuna seeing the armies on the battlefield and his reaction in that he did not want to fight the battle. And he gives subsequently, he gives a number of arguments why he does not want to fight the battle. In other words, uh, he wants to avoid his service to Krishna. Now, this is something that many devotees may experience from time to time, that they do not want to uh, engage in their service to Krishna. They may feel uh, despondent or bewildered or overcome by Maya, and they don't want to continue with their service to Krishna. So uh, every devotee may feel like that from time to time. And Arjuna, because he is an exemplary devotee, he is teaching us that we should continue with our service under all circumstances. Uh, so in the beginning, he becomes bewildered. The Krishna speaks to the Bhagavad Gita. He, his bewilderment is overcome. And then he is able to continue in his service once again. Uh, so he gives excuses as to why he does not want to fight the battle. Now, uh, Krishna gives his response. Arjuna says, Shishas teham satimam twam prapanam. I am your disciple or soul surrendered unto you please instruct me arjuna says this to krishna in uh verse 7 of the second chapter up until that point krishna does not instruct arjuna deeply or philosophically because arjuna is not yet ready to hear it but when arjuna uh, has the right mood and he now wants to accept krishna's instructions now krishna is willing to instruct him. So that's where we are now. <clears throat> uh, we're at the point where Arjuna is surrendered. Krishna is willing to instruct him. And now from verses uh, 11 to 30, uh, Arjuna is going to hear about the subject matter of jnana. Krishna is going to speak jnana, divya jnana, which means transcendental knowledge. Uh, he's going to give knowledge to, to Arjuna, spiritual knowledge. Uh, the difference, the difference differentiates the difference between matter and spirit, which is the basis of spiritual understanding, the basis of spiritual life. So uh, he's uh, going to convince Arjuna to fight uh, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra to continue in his service. But to continue in his service, first of all, he has to receive transcendental knowledge or act on the on the platform of spiritual progress and spiritual understanding. So we're going to hear uh, Krishna speak jnana uh, from verses 11 to 30. So if you have any questions or comments as we go, then please ask. So we're going to hear some very famous verses. Very famous verses from the Bhagavad Gita tonight. Text 11. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for that which is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the dead. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada says in the purport that a learned man, one who knows what is body and what is soul, 
does not lament for the living nor for the dead. Knowledge means to know matter and spirit and the controller of both. So uh, the first thing that Krishna does when he speaks to Arjuna, when he begins to instruct him, uh, he calls it indirectly, Prabhupada says he calls him a fool, which is the position that uh, the guru will take with the disciple. Right? The guru will destroy uh, the disciple's false ego. And sometimes he has to chastise or correct the disciple. So the first thing Krishna indirectly does, he calls Arjuna a fool. While speaking learned words, you are lamenting for that which is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living for, or, or for the dead. Now, uh, Krishna speaks this knowledge to lift Arjuna out of his ignorance. Uh, the first thing he does, he gives him divyagan, or he differentiates between matter and spirit. What is the difference between matter? What is the difference between spirit? Uh, because in this material world, uh, factually speaking, we are all in illusion. We're all in Maya. And therefore we do, you know, myself included, we all uh, lament uh, for the passing of someone that we're attached to. Because what binds us to this world is attachment. Uh, it is desire. And when we have material attachments, when we're too much attached to the body and our bodily relationships, when someone uh, disappears, we lament. Even though factually speaking, as Krishna will describe in this section of the Bhagavad Gita, there is no cause for lamentation because for the soul, there is neither uh, birth or death. Right? So it is simply that we are feeling that separation based on our bodily uh, consideration at this point in time. So this is Krishna's first instruction uh, to Arjuna. Uh, Do not lament for the living nor for the dead. But rather, uh, understand the difference between matter and spirit and the controller of both. So these are very powerful instructions which Krishna is giving uh, in the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. Text number 12. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all of these kings nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So Prabhupada explains in the purport that only saintly persons who see within and without the same Supreme Lord can attain eternal peace. This is a famous verse from the uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, right? Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all of these kings, nor in the future shall any of us be, cease to be. Prabhupada says, Krishna is the supreme individual eternal person. And both liberating and conditioned living entities are individual eternal persons. This statement of Krishna's is authoritative because Krishna cannot be subject to illusion. It is clearly mentioned in the Gita that spiritual individuality is understood by devotees. So Prabhupada makes, these are very powerful statements, and there's a lot of instruction within Prabhupada's statements. First of all, he says, Krishna is this supreme eternal person, and both uh, conditioned and liberated living entities. So, Krishna is eternal and we are eternal. Never was a time when we did not exist, nor you, nor all of us, nor in the future shall, us, shall any of us cease to be. This is divyagan, spiritual knowledge. Uh, all of us are eternally existing. Right? That is spiritual realization or spiritual consciousness. When we understand the soul is eternal, the soul is immortal. 
So that is the first instruction uh, which Krishna gives to uh, Arjuna within the, the Bhagavad Gita. You're not the body. And if you look at the sum total of Srila Prabhupada's uh, instructions, you know, if, if you ask any devotee in ISKCON, what, what was Prabhupada's most prominent instruction? Everyone will say, you are not the body. You are not the body. That was Prabhupada's principal instruction. And, and based upon, it's based upon this opening section of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is saying to Arjuna, you're not the body. There is nothing to lament about. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor, nor all of these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So in other words, Krishna is eternal. He is making that point, And we are also eternal both in our conditioned state and our liberated state. We are eternal souls. Uh, then Prabhupada says, this statement of Krishna's is authoritative because Krishna cannot be subject to illusion. Now, why cannot Krishna be subject to illusion? Because, as he states within the Bhagavad Gita, aham savasya prabhavo mataha savam pravatate, I am the Supreme Lord. I am the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So God, by definition, cannot be subject to illusion. And if this is God speaking, which we have faith that it is, there is no illusion. You know, Krishna's words are beyond illusion. Uh, they are transcendental. Uh, Prabhupada then says, it is clearly mentioned in the Gita that spiritual individuality is understood by devotees. Bhaktosime Sakacheti, Krishna says, only a devotee, Bhakja Mama Bijanati, Yavanyas Chasmi Tatvataha. Krishna says within the Gita, only uh, a devotee can understand this spiritual science. If you don't have bhakti or devotion, you cannot understand this spiritual science. You can't understand it. So it's a very important point which Krishna is uh, giving us at this point in time. So, uh, with, without devotion, without bhakti, one cannot understand all of this. One can understand that one is eternal. Even a mayavadi, an impersonalist can understand that. But to understand that eternality in context of uh, the soul's eternal relationship to the Supreme Lord, only that can be understood by a devotee. So verse number 13. This is one of the most famous verses in the Bhagavad Gita. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada, uh, in his, in the purport, he says, a man who has perfect knowledge of the constitution of the individual soul, the super soul, and both material and spiritual nature is called Dira, a most sober man. Such a man is never deluded by the change of bodies. <clears throat> right? Not deluded uh, by the change of bodies. So, Dira's Tatra Namuyati, uh, Krishna says in this verse that uh, someone who is uh, soba, dira. Now this word is very important. It's very uh, instructive, right? That a devotee must become dira. Dira means uh, sober, right? He must have sobriety. The devotee must must have sobriety. When a dove, when a devotee is dira. 
It means he has control of his senses. This is spoken of by Rupa Goswami in the Upadeshamrita, the first verse of the Nectar of Instruction. Uh, the devotee is uh, Dira. Dira means sober. Right? He is not bewildered. <laughs> so he becomes a sober person, not bewildered by material change. So uh, this is the qualification to understand Divyagyan or spiritual knowledge, to understand the difference between matter and spirit, or that you are not the body, you are the soul. You must be dearer. You must be sober. You must be understanding, and you must have control of your senses. Right? And if you have these, these qualities, then you can understand this spiritual science properly. So... One who understands the nature of all of these things, the difference between matter and spirit, his relationship with God, his eternal identity as being God's servant, that person is dearer. Uh, he is fully qualified and uh, he is never deluded by the change of bodies. In other words, he can remain fixed in the service of Krishna. That's why Krishna begins the Bhagavad Gita by giving us Divya Gyan, because if we understand this spiritual knowledge, we will remain fixed in our bhakti. Sometimes devotees come to us and they, uh, they, they confide confidentially. They say, I'm struggling in devotional service. So we say, explain to us what is your situation at this point in time? What is your sadhana like? You know, what, are, what are your practices like? And I've seen time and time again, when devotees are struggling in their spiritual life, right, it always means they are not reading or hearing and chanting enough, or they're not reading Prabhupada's books enough. Because if you read and you hear and chant regularly, and if you're reading Prabhupada's books regularly, you will not uh, struggle in your spiritual life, in the sense you will, will remain steady and fixed in bhakti, in devotional service. So that's why we need to study Prabhupada's books on a, on a regular basis. So text number 14. Now, text 14 and 15, uh, after Krishna gives three verses describing you're not the body or the soul, and explains the difference between matter and spirit. Uh, then in verses 14 and 15, Krishna then explains about uh, becoming, uh, how do you say it? Tolerant of the dualities in this material world. Right? He teaches us to become tolerant in this material world, how to tolerate, tolerate their dualities, which we find ourselves in, in this material world. So text number 14. O son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, O scion of Bharata, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. So, first of all, Krishna says you're not the body or the soul. Uh, and then the, <laughs> the next thing that Krishna says is uh, that you must tolerate the dualities in this material world, because this material world is made up of dualities. This material world will disappoint you. Right? There's no doubt. So Prabhupada says in the purport, in the proper discharge of duty, one has to learn to tolerate non-permanent appearances and disappearances of happiness and distress. Then Prabhupada says, a great heritage brings responsibility in the matter of proper discharge of duties. Hmm. 
So when you become a little advanced, and this is actually, it's a practical measurement or guideline in spiritual life, because how do we know? Sometimes devotees say this, how do I know if I'm advancing in Krishna consciousness? What are the markers? What are, what is the, what are, what are the indications that I'm actually advancing in spiritual life? So one of the indications that you are actually advancing is that you will become tolerant right, of the difficulties, of the challenges in this material world. You will tolerate, you'll learn to tolerate. Right? So this is proof that someone's actually advancing in their Krishna consciousness. They're tolerant, right? They tolerate the difficulties, the happiness, the distress, it all becomes tolerable. Uh, they don't become so affected. Their devotional service becomes steady and fixed. Uh, because they don't fluctuate when there's happiness and distress. You see, neophyte devotees, they always fluctuate when there's happiness and distress. Right? When there's happiness or too much happiness or too much distress, they they become distracted from their bhakti. <coughs> Whereas a an advanced devotee. He doesn't fluctuate, right? He understands whether there's happiness or distress. I just remain fixed in my bhakti, in my devotional service. That's a, that's a symptom of advancement in Krishna consciousness. So text number 15. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. It's a very powerful verse. Uh, Prabhupada says, anyone who is steady in his determination for the advanced stage of spiritual realization and can equally tolerate distress and happiness is certainly eligible for liberation. So Krishna is explaining this in the Bhagavad Gita. He also explains this in the Srimad Bhagavatam. If we can tolerate all of the difficulties, the happiness, the distress, all the difficulties that we go through in spiritual life, you become eligible for liberation. Right? You can make tangible advancement. Uh, if you're unable to tolerate the difficulties in this material world, how are you advancing in Krishna consciousness? It will become very difficult. So we have to learn you know, to tolerate the happiness, the stress that we find in this material world. So text number 16, uh, now from 16 to uh, 30, Krishna is going to speak about the nature of the soul, the nature of spirit, uh, which is important for us to understand in the beginning of spiritual life. What is the nature of spirit? Uh, if we cannot, if we cannot understand the nature of spirit, Right, then we cannot advance in our Krishna consciousness. Right? So we must understand what is the nature of spirit. So now Krishna will speak in these verses. Uh, text number 16. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. So, seers of the truth have seen that the, the soul endures, it, 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 it lives on, and the body is temporary. Well, that's basic realization in spiritual life. That's what makes us fixed. That's what, that's what fixes us on the path of devotion. When we realize this material world is a, is a temporary place of suffering. 
You cannot be happy here. You cannot have a permanent situation here. Krishna says later in the Bhagavad Gita, this material world is Dukalayam, Ashashvatam. It is temporary. It is uh, it is miserable. So because it is, it is temporary and miserable, you cannot enjoy here permanently. And Krishna gives us that instruction. Right? Why does he give us, give us that instruction? So we will renounce this material world. So these are the basic instructions Krishna is giving the Gita so that we will become detached and renounced in this material world. Prabhupada says, the removal of ignorance involves the reestablishment of the eternal relationship between the worshipper and the worshipable and the consequent understanding of the difference between the living entities and Krishna. Uh, this is the glory uh, of Vaishnava philosophy because in the beginning of spiritual life, we understand we are not the body, we are the soul. That's the basic tenet or the basic instruction that we're given. Now, okay, now you understand you're not the body, you are the soul. So then the next question is, what is your occupational duty? What is your eternal duty, your dharma? What is that duty? The duty... Uh, of the soul is is to serve Krishna. Right? Jivara Srupahoy Krishna and Nichadas. Right? The nature of the soul. So if if you understand you're the soul, now you must understand what is your constitutional position or your Dharma, your Sanatan Dharma, your duty, and that is service. So Prabhupada is explaining this in the purport. Now that you understand, Krishna says you're not the body. So okay, you're not the body. Now serve uh, the eternal soul. Right? Now you understand who you are. Now understand what you should do. <laughs> and Prabhupada says this comes with the consequent understanding of the difference between uh, the eternal jiva, the eternal uh, soul and the supreme entity. Uh, that is complete knowledge. That is given in, in Bhagavad philosophy. That is given in Vaishnav literature. Right? We are not the body, we're the soul, and we are Krishna's eternal servant. Krishna is supreme. We are finite. We are Anu. He is Vipu, and then we serve him. That is our understanding. Text number 17. That which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. Uh, Prabhupada says in the purport for text number 17, the current of the soul is felt all over the body as consciousness. And that is proof of the presence of the soul. The fragmental parts of the Lord are sparks of the rays of the Lord, called Prabha. Only the insane man can think of the soul and, and of the soul as all pervading Vishnu Tattva. <coughs> so that which pervades the entire body you should know is indestructible. So Prabhupada points out that which pervades the whole body. Uh, so how do we know the soul exists? By its symptom, which is consciousness, chitta. Right? Our consciousness pervades our entire body, even though the soul is situated as a spark in the heart region, its presence pervades the entire body. So that is the nature of the soul. It, it pervades. What is, this, what is the symptom of the sun? 
It's the sunlight. That's how we know the sun exists because it's energy pervades the universe. How do we know the soul exists? Because it's energy pervades. This is the understanding we're given in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada says in the purport that uh, the soul pervades the entire body. The soul doesn't pervade the entire universe. Sometimes, this is my avowed philosophy, that we pervade everything. We don't pervade everything. Right? Prabhupada says only an insane person confuses oneself to be Vishnu Tattva, that we pervade everything. How do we pervade everything? It's not possible. <laughs> that is that is illusion. Right? But people think like that. They think, oh yes, I pervade everything. So that it, that people do not have this proper understanding. Text number 18. The material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight, O descend, descendant of Bharata. Prabhupada says in the purport, there is no cause of lamentation because the living entity cannot be killed, nor can the material body be saved. Then Prabhupada says, the living entity acquires this material body according to his work, and therefore observance of religious principles should be utilized. So th this is, a, this is a, an important philosophical point. Uh, we have acquired this... Uh, due to misuse of independence, due to material consciousness, consciousness and material activities. When you perform material activities uh, and you engage in material in, and you have material consciousness, what is the result? The result is that you uh, create a material body in the sense, Prabhupada uses the saying, man proposes, God disposes. So we desire, we have material desires and we act on those material desires. And that causes us to have a material body because we desire to enjoy separate from God. God gives us a material body in order to enjoy separately from him. So if we're suffering in this world and we have a material body and we're in ignorance, that is because we have created that situation. Now, Prabhupada says in the, in the purport that uh, by working according to religious principles, Sanat and Dharma, the instructions of the Bhagavad Gita, offering everything to Krishna for his satisfaction, that using your body in that way purifies the consciousness and elevates us out of this material world. So Prabhupada and Krishna are giving the answers, the solution of how to come out of this material world once and for all. Keshava. Text number 19. Yep. My spiritual master said before he left, he's just changing services. Yeah, very nice. He's just going from one service into another service, whatever that may be. Yeah, so that's, that's the symptom of a self-realized person. One who is not bewildered by the change of body. That is the symptom of self-realization. That's how we can tangibly tell if someone is self-realized. Text number 19. Neither he who thinks the living entity the slayer, nor he who thinks it is slain, is in knowledge. For the self slays, nor Oh, sorry, for the self slays not, nor is slain. So Prabhupada explains in the purport that the soul is so small 
it is impossible to kill him. What is killed is the body only. So Arjuna is about to fight a battle. And while Arjuna is about to fight this battle, you know, many, he's going to slay many people. Millions of warriors are going to be slain by Arjuna. So when you're about to, when, if you're about to kill someone, factually speaking, no one can be killed. What, all we're doing is removing the material body because you cannot kill the soul. Socrates said this. Socrates said, you know, they, they, they made him drink hemlock uh, poison. He said, first you must find me, then you can kill me. <laughs> so this is a symptom of self-realization. One who understands, he's not the body, understands the body is just temporary. We cannot kill the body. The body cannot be slain. <laughs> uh, what is killed is only the body. The, the, the soul remains. So, so Krishna is giving this transcendental knowledge to Arjuna. Of course, uh, Prabhupada says in the purple, this, however, does not at all encourage killing of the body. The Vedic injunction is mahim shat bhutani, <coughs> never commit violence to anyone. Uh, we should not commit violence to anyone, right? Even though you cannot kill the body, it doesn't mean that we should think that we have permission to, uh, to, to kill someone because that, that violent act will just cause karma, uh, for you and, uh, uh, it, it is not, not, if we cannot create life, we cannot take life. That's why we don't kill animals also, because we cannot bring the animal back to life. Therefore, we cannot kill the animal. We can't kill human beings unless you can bring them back to life. And so it's not, it's not a, it's not permission to do these things, but because it is Arjuna's duty to fight in a battle, a, a, a holy battle. Krishna says to him, you cannot kill the, the, the soul. It's only the body you're removing. Text number 20. For the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada points out that the soul undergoes no changes like the body. Only one who has become free of all material desires, as well as lamentations, can, by the grace of the Lord, understand the glories of the soul. So we must overcome uh, lamentation and desire. Brahma Buddha Prasanatma Na Sochiti Na Kangshiti. No lamentation, no hankering. As long as we hanker and lament for things in this world, then we will suffer in this material world. As long as there's hankering and there's lamentation. <coughs> We will suffer. That will make us attached to this material world. So to get uh, detached from this material world, we have to overcome this anchoring and this lamentation. Then we can understand the glories of the soul. Text number 21. Opata, how can a person who knows the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable, kill anyone or cause anyone to kill. So Prabhupada says when Krishna 
orders something, it must be concluded that it is for the supreme justice. And thus one should follow the instruction. So we are forbidden to kill. We're not allowed to kill animals. Even one time, uh, Tamar Krishmaraj was in India and he went into a room and there was many mosquitoes in the room. And he, he started killing the mosquitoes. And then Prabhupada said, actually, you're only allowed to kill them when they go to bite you. When they go, if they attack you or bite you, you're, if you kill them, there's no reaction. But if they're not attacking and you start to kill them, you will get some karma. So uh, that is the position that a devotee is very careful not to kill anything unnecessarily, not to cause harm to others uh, unnecessarily. But if Krishna requires that that is your duty, that is your service, that you must kill on his behalf, there is no reaction. Uh, then it, the, the, then that, that activity is called, it's actually bhakti, it's a karma. Uh, but we must be sure that it is Krishna's desire. You know, sometimes there are other religions in the world who claim they are performing a holy act when they kill others. But we know that this is done out of ignorance and therefore we do not accept uh, their activities. Text number 22. A, as a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. Prabhupada says in the purport, the super soul fulfills the desire of the atomic soul as one friend fulfills the desire of another. Although they are the same in quality, one is captivated by the fruits of the material tree, while the other is simply witnessing the activities of his friend. So, uh, this is a famous verse from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, this basically it basically explains the principle of reincarnation. Just as we we put on fresh clothes every day, right? we put on fresh clothes, but we remain the same person. But the clothes are fresh. That's the external covering. So in a similar way, uh, the devotee, he understands that when he changes body, it is just a change of dress. It's external to his kind. It's not, it's not his eternal consciousness. It's just an external situation. Right? That is actual self-realization. So we put on garments, we change garments, we, we put on a new body, and we change into another body. This is just external to the soul. Uh, Prabhupada points out, he gives the example of the, the two birds in the tree. Uh, and one of the birds, uh, the two birds in the tree, it's from the Swedish Ritali Upanishad. Right? It's an example which is given that there are two birds sitting in a tree. One is the soul, one is the super soul, Jivatma and Paramatma. And one bird is captivated by the fruits in the tree. And he's just pecking and eating the fruits. And he's not even conscious of the presence of the other bird. And the other bird is simply watching and witnessing right? and facilitating in this, in this sense, because it's the super soul facilitating the activities of the other personality. So that is Krishna's position. 
He simply, man proposes, God disposes. He simply allows us to enjoy superlative things. But he is not factually interested in what we're trying to enjoy, and he does not uh, he's not interested in what we're trying to enjoy. And he's not he himself is not captivated or attracted. But he's just waiting for us to turn back to him and to then re engage in reciprocation with him. Text number 23. The soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. Mm. Uh, so Prabhupada says in the purport, the individual souls are eternally uh, separated parts of the Supreme Soul because they are atomic individual souls eternally. They are prone to be covered by the illusory energy, and thus they become separated from the association of the Lord. Hmm. So, the soul is known as tatashta. Tatashta means marginal. Marginal means like the beach. When you go to the ocean, there's the beach. The beach is the demarcation between the land and the water. So it can be covered by the water, just like the soul can be covered by Maya, or when the water withdraws, it's in its natural state. So that is the difference. So it can be in, in, or it can be out, according to, according to the situation. So, uh, it is being mentioned here that the individual soul can be covered, uh, or he can be uncovered, which is his constitutional position, to be uh, free from Maya. Now, the verse says, the soul can never be cut by any weapon. This is important because Arjuna, he had acquired many astras to use in this battle of Kuru, etc. So he had many sharp arrows, right? but, he could, but Krishna is saying, you cannot cut to pieces the soul, even with all of your weapons, your arrows. You cannot burn them with fire. You know, he had fire weapons, Brahmastro, like nuclear weapons. Moistened by water, they had water weapons. You know, they would, they would draw their arrows, chant one mantra, the Astra, to invoke the Astra, the weapon, and then fire the, the arrow. And then when the arrow hit, it would, it would uh, turn into... Like a like a tsunami, like a tidal wave of water, you know, which could destroy the enemy, drown the enemy. But Krishna is saying, you cannot burn the soul, you cannot drown the soul. The wind, they had wind weapons, right? All of these weapons, they could not harm the soul. They can only destroy the body. Text number twenty four. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can neither and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. All these Prabhupada says in the purple, all these qualifications of the atomic soul definitely prove that the soul is eternally the atomic particle of the spirit, soul, spirit whole, and he remains the same eternally. Mm. 
So as Krishna has said, uh, the, the, so, the soul is eternally the same. Right? He cannot be uh, changed. One of the words, the Sanskrit words, which Krishna uses here is uh, stana. Stana means like fixed, cannot be changed. Right? The soul cannot be changed. He's fixed in his position, in his consciousness. Right? So because the soul is fixed in his consciousness, he can't be changed. Right? He has to be in that, that, that perfect position. Mm -hmm. And this, this defeats Mayavad philosophy because the Mayavad the Mayavadis say originally all of us were uh, part of Brahman, part of like the great light. But we have fragmented off and we have fallen into Maya. And when we become free from Maya, we merge back into that great light. But Krishna says stana. Stana means the soul is fixed it does not change so it means we could not have fragmented off because that means we've changed if we were one how do we break into individual parts so when krishna says we are stana unchangeable it means that we uh we are eternally anu eternal small particles of spirit which are eternally meant to serve krishna that is our constitutional position that does not change that's why the vaishnava philosophy the bhagavat bhagavat philosophy the philosophy of the bhagavatam is uh perfect and complete and this mayavad philosophy is speculative okay hmm. Text number 25. It is said that the soul is invisible, inconceivable, and immutable. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. Prabhupada says the soul's existence cannot be established experimentally beyond the proof of Shruti or Vedic wisdom. We have to accept this truth because there is no other source of understanding the existence of the soul, although it is a fact by perception. So these ancient teachings, the Bhagavad Gita, which is Savo Panishado Gavo, it is it is the essence of all Upanishads. Right? That is the uh, the soul's position. Right? The Bhagavad Gita says the soul soul's position. Uh, is it's described in all the Vedas and especially in the Bhagavad Gita, the soul is existent. And as Prabhupada points out, it is perceivable. We see the soul is present everywhere. Wherever there is life, that means the soul is present. So it is perceivable. So for us, both by Vedic proof and also by perception, we understand the existence of the soul. If, however, you think that the soul or the symptoms of life is always born and dies forever, you still have no reason to lament, uh, O oh mighty armed. Uh, so Prabhupada says, even if one does not believe in the existence of the soul, there's still no cause for lamentation. <laughs> so like if you had, you know, if you say there's no such thing as the soul, and this is what many people say in this world, the soul does not exist. You know, we're just life, we're just chemicals. Then why do you lament? You know, if we drop a bag of chemicals on the floor of the laboratory, we don't cry. But if, if this bag of chemicals perishes, it dies, then what takes place? Everyone laments. So what are you lamenting about? You're lamenting about separation from the soul. 
because the chemicals are still there. So why is it you're not lamenting that? You're lamenting the personality which you which you are separated from. <laughs> one who has taken his birth is sure to die. And after death, one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. So, Prabhupada says, by avoiding the discharge of one's proper duty, one is not able to stop death. And one is degraded due to one's selection of the wrong path. So, we might say, like, we might find ourselves in a situation like, like Arjuna. We're on a battlefield. We have to fight. We have to kill. And we're lamenting, I don't want to do this. But the fact is, you're going to die later anyway. So you might lose your life on the battlefield fighting for Krishna, fulfilling your duty. But that's a glorious death because that is in Krishna's service. We must be willing to do that. Whereas if we have to leave the battlefield, if we choose to leave the battlefield and then we die later on, there's no glory in that death. So you're going to die anyway. So we might as well die in Krishna's service. All created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state and unmanifest again when annihilated. So what is the need for lamentation? Prabhupada says, the material body has no factual existence in relation to the soul. There is nothing to lament about because when the body dies, it is just the material form perishing. The soul still exists. There is nothing to lament. This is very advanced consciousness, but this is the fact. Some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear of him as amazing, while others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. So Prabhupada says, it is difficult to find a person who perfectly understands the super soul, the atomic soul, and their respective functions and relationships. It is still more difficult to find a man who has derived full benefit from knowledge of the soul and who is able to describe the soul. Okay. So if we find someone who understands the difference between matter and spirit and realizes that, then we should associate and serve that person. Someone like Prabhupada and Prabhupada's sincere followers. And the final verse in this section, this Gyana section of Bhagavad Gita. O descendant of Bharata, he who dwells in the body can never be slain. Therefore, you need not grieve for any living being. And Prabhupada says in the Prabhupada, the soul is immortal and the body is temporary. So even though the soul is immortal and the body is temporary, we don't encourage violence unnecessarily. So that is the Yana section. Uh, and uh, that will be the final class for the next five or six weeks. Um, Kartik begins tomorrow. And in about 10, 10 days time, we're traveling to the Holy Dharms, Mayapur, Puri and Vrindavan. So we will resume uh, our classes again in the beginning of December. So there won't be any classes from now until the beginning of December. So thank you for coming and we will see you soon. Hare Krishna. Happy Kartik. Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming. Happy Kartik. Have a safe fight. See you soon. Yes, I pray for pray for us, please. Yes, please we'll be for... missing you and thinking of you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Krishna. Please Krishna. pray for us. Yes, for sure, Papa. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. See you soon.
Det er søn, Babo. Haribo. Se søn, Kajshin. Haribo. Haribo. <laughs>